Photomultipliers come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. You can get them, small ones like this. They all basically work in the same principle. You have a photocathode, uh, in this case it's coated onto this glass front, and you have dynodes which are electrodes which are at potentials that cause a cascade of electrons from that come in from the cath photocathode to the anode. Uh, for detection. Um, some use these kind of curved electrodes as in these two. Uh, this one uses what looks like little Venetian blinds uh, stored in each of these trays. You can't quite make it out through the, the photocathode window. Uh, this one looks like it's got very large amplification because each of the dynodes form uh, basically an amplifier. The various voltages that are required for each uh, dynode are achieved by just a simple uh, potential divider uh, from the basically the anode to the cathode and uh, with each uh, dynode being teed off from part of the divider. So it's quite straightforward. Okay, so first thing to do was to make a light tight container. So uh, I have a bit of pipe here and we can now put the photomultiplier into this pipe. The bottom of the pipe is covered with a, a layer of tin foil. Uh, hopefully that's not going to let any light in. Got it now sitting on a, a source which is basically a gas mantle so there's some thorium in there and there's no scintillating crystal or anything and there's no light getting into the photomultiplier and we're sitting at 900 volts and the Geiger counter is silent as we'd expect. Okay, I'm going to now place a piece of the uh, plastic scintillator onto the base of this photomultiplier. Hopefully it will stay there. And we'll run the same experiment again. Apply the voltage. Okay, there's the initial rush as the voltage comes up. But now we are detecting radiation from this thorium mantle. And just for interest, this is just a, a piece of plastic which happens to fluoresce quite well, in this greeny kind of yellow, and if I point the UV laser thing at it, it sh shows it's quite fluorescent. I'm going to try that now onto the detector. See if that has any effect. So again we heard the initial charging but it seems to not detect much at all there. Which is what you'd expect, it's not made for the job. Okay, I'm going to try this proper piece here. It's quite a large piece of plastic scintillator. Okay, once again, apply the voltage. Yeah, that one keeps it busy. That's good. <laughs> so that keeps it 25, 30 counts per second with that uh, particular piece on it. <laughs> okay, finally, just a little interesting experiment to do quickly here. Um, I've actually got a small x ray tube here, and we have our photomultiplier tube with the larger plastic scintillator on it. I have a Geiger Muller tube which has got a mica window here and we have the voltage uh, on the photomultiplier tube. The voltage I'm using for the uh, x-ray tube is very low. This is a, a CRT supply for an old uh, radar display. It, it's set to give me about 10 kV, currently giving me 8.8 .8 kV and the heater on the uh, x-ray tube is off just now but I can control the current on that. So I'm going to bring up the current on the heater and see what happens. The heater is just starting to glow and you can hear on the GM tube it's starting to detect x-rays but the photomultiplier isn't detecting anything but of course it has to, the energy has to be strong enough to go through this aluminium foil here at the front. It's quite surprising you can generate 
uh, X-ray detectable X-rays with such a low anode voltage. And the only way that these are actually getting from the X-ray tube is that it, this X-ray tube has a, a beryllium window on it, which is uh, uh, basically transparent to X-rays. Just to prove our detector is still working. The uh, gas mantle is able to be detected in both 